All right, we're going to get started in the book of Revelation. We're going to get started in a new section in Revelation, so do a little bit of an overview looking at this new section, uh, as well as where we've come from, and then maybe a few verses in the new section also. In the context... We've been looking at the seven churches, finishing up in chapter 3. I think it is interesting in verse 21 of chapter 3, it says, To him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So the last exhortation as far as the reward of overcoming has to do with sitting with God and the Son in their throne. And then chapter 4 gives us a picture of God on his throne, and chapter 5 gives us a picture of Christ and his preeminence and majesty approaching the throne of God uh, to ask of the nations uh, for his inheritance, as it were, as Psalm 2 talks about. So chapter four, after this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like an emerald and round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion and the second beast was like a calf. And the third beast had the face of a man And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him, that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and loose the seals, the book of providence of God's purposes upon the earth. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither looked thereon, and I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said to me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, 
stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So we have the son coming to the father. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that lives forever and ever. And then go to Ezekiel chapter 1. If the book of Revelation is difficult in the New Testament, the book of Ezekiel is difficult in the Old Testament. It says in Ezekiel 1.1, Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, the fourth month of the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And how close the vision is, is, is startling at times. Verse 26 of chapter 1. And above the firmament that was over their heads was a likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber and the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about it as the appearance of the bow that's in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and heard a voice as one that spake. And later on, Ezekiel will also talk about the, the four beasts, the four manifestations of the beasts, just like John does in the book of Revelation. So we'll give those readings just to give us a kind of a foundation. Thank you, Father, for your word. <clears throat> your word is precious to us. We ask that you would forgive our sins this morning. Cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness and purify our hearts and minds to be able to quiet our hearts before you as we think upon you again. And our desire is to understand the words of your book uh, in order that we might live. We ask, O oh Lord, in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So in chapters 1 through 3 of Revelation, we have been looking at Christ walking among his churches, Christ holding the ministers in his hand, and Christ revealed himself, even similar to some of the revelations of Ezekiel, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is the ancient of days, the various ways in which he is revealed. In chapter 4, then, we are given this vision of heaven, uh, which was promised to all that overcome. And we're going to look at that. 
Uh, God the Father is represented in chapter 4 in a very glorious majesty. And then in chapter 5, Christ the Lamb is represented in his glory. Both chapters end with a similar note, giving praise, honor, and glory to the two, these two persons of the Godhead, the Spirit being mentioned also in those chapters. In Revelation chapter 4, the way it begins is after this, after this, after the Spirit has revealed to John and to the churches the messages of these seven churches, and he finishes each message with to him that overcomes and then states something. This work of overcoming, John in his small epistle, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, said, whatever is born of God overcomes, overcomes the world. So this is a divine work. We know that this overcoming isn't us, you know, scrunching our heads up as strong as we can get to try to do the work ourselves. We know that there's a divine work that has to go on in our souls in order for us to overcome. Whatever is born of God, begotten of God, that's what overcomes. And he goes on to say in 1 John 5, 4 and 5, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, which is a gift from God. Verse 5, who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So this overcoming is a divine work. It's a being begotten of God. It's this faith that is given to us as a gift, this believing upon Christ. But faith in what? Belief in what? Turn to Revelation chapter 12. And again, we'll remind ourselves this is a good verse to have set aside as far as our understanding of overcoming. Chapter 12 and verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. So how do we overcome? Well, it's in faith in Christ by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect finished work, the perfect atonement made in our behalf. It's how we overcome. We overcome because that gives us a clear conscience. It gives us a, a right standing with God, justification, and a, a certainty of eternal glory. And by the word of their testimony, that is confessing our belief in the blood of Jesus Christ. So we overcome because we have the blood of Christ. We also overcome because we continually confess it. This, this reestablishes it in our own hearts and minds as we confess it to others. And then he says, and find my note, and they loved not their lives unto death. So it's a persevering, a persevering in the belief of the blood of Christ, in the confessing of the blood of Christ, even unto death. So go to Revelation chapter 2, and let's just take a really quick survey of what is promised to each church and each believer in the churches if they overcome. And what I want you to see is that each of these is related to the eternal sphere. Each of these is related to heaven itself. So in Revelation 2, 7, he says, to him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Chapter two in verse 11, he that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death of eternal hell. Chapter two and verse 17, to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna and give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knows saving he which receives it. This personal relationship that we have with God and shall have with God for all of eternity. Revelation 2 and 26. And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations. Which is spoken of in the very last church as well about sitting in Christ's throne and spoken throughout the New Testament as judging with Christ in the last day. Chapter 3 in verse 5, he that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot his name out of the book of life but will confess his name before my father and before his angels all within the eternal sphere. Chapter 3 verse 12, him that overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write upon him the name of my God 
and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Again, the eternal sphere, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And then chapter 3, 21, to him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. So we have, so we have in chapter 4 then, in these first verses, is the realization or the manifestation of what these promises mean. What these promises mean when he opens up a door to heaven and begins to show us what the eternal reward is. In Revelation 21, in verse 7, he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. So we will have everything. Of course, to have God is to have everything. To have the son is to have everything. It's to partake in his inheritance, which is everything. So in chapter 4, in verse 1, he says, after this, that is, after all these promises are made, and now we're going to open up to you the, the reward that we've been talking about to those who overcome, those who believe upon Christ, who have been born of God. After this, I looked, he says in chapter 4 and verse 1, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. After the Spirit admonished the churches to persevere in the faith and reach eternal glory as the reward, John looked, he says, and behold, what a surprise, a great surprise, a door opened in heaven, which is the reward of those who overcome. Behold, John says, it was an amazing sight a look into eternal glory, a view of the reward set before us. In the Geneva Bible notes, they write, heaven was opened, that is, that heavenly things were unlocked. We enter into the divine sheepfold through the door of Christ. We enter into heaven through the divine door of Christ. The door is the entrance. The door is the entrance into the holy place. David had talked about in Leviticus about holiness and here is the holy place and here is an open door into the holy place in hebrews chapter 9 in verse 6 where the comparison is being made between the old covenant and the new covenant he says now when these things were thus ordained the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of god but into the second, the Holy of Holies, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. And by this, the Holy Ghost was signifying that the way into the holiest was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was standing. The way into eternal glory, the way into heaven, was not yet manifested, that is, the way, the truth, the life, the Lord Jesus Christ had not yet been manifested among us from the Old Testament because that was going to be the door. These other things were shadows of the door. Hebrews 9 and 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So Christ is the first to enter in and open that door. The reason the door is open is because Christ walked through it, because he had satisfied the demands of a, of a holy God. Hebrews 10 and verse 12, but this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. That's the picture of Revelation 5. So we have Revelation 4, we have a view of, of God, the Father, Revelation 5, the view of the Lamb, who is in the midst of all of this, in the midst of the throne. He is the center of attention in that chapter, who has forever sat down because of the atonement made. Hebrews 10 and 19 says, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, this, this true holy place, the the, the true reality, by the blood of Jesus. It's how we overcome, 
by the blood of Jesus, and it's how we enter into the holy place. It's how we then see and enter through the door that's open by a new and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Ellicott writes this. When it says in Revelation 4.1, Behold, I looked, and a door was opened in heaven. Ellicott writes, He did not look and see a door opening. He saw, and lo, the door stood open. There are differences as well as similarities between this vision and others where glimpses into heaven were given to prophets and saints in Ezekiel's vision and in the scene of Matthew 3 and Acts 7, the heavens divide. In this, a door stands open. The way into the presence of God lies open. And all who have faith may enter. In the minds of such, the thoughts of the heavenly will will mingle with the sorrows of the earthly. And the calm of security will be theirs. But the scenes of earth's troubles will always be dispiriting to those who can't reach the heavenly viewpoint. And so we have to have the heavenly viewpoint. All right, Revelation 4.1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as a trumpet talking with me that said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. This particular door was the entrance for John into eternal glory to have things revealed to him that would be useful to the church of Christ until the coming of Christ. The voice that speaks to John is not an ambiguous voice. It is very clear. It's a trumpet. This is not somebody's dream in the night with confusing events where he's seeing just a lot of, of nonsense. This is a divine revelation, and therefore it's clear, it's unambiguous as a trumpet call. No one will mistake the trumpet call at the second coming of Christ, and John didn't mistake this. It was a call to come up hither because he was going up to the eternal state. It's a going up, it's a coming up from the temporal state to the eternal, from the death of this world to the life of the afterlife, from the earthy to the heavenly, from struggle on this earth to the freedom of heaven, from the tainted with sin here on earth to the holy place in heaven. Come up, come up to the divine revelation. Have your eyes opened to the purposes of the eternal God. So a trumpet talked with him and said, come up and I'll show you these things which must be, not which might be or which God would like to be, but they must be. It is the predestinated work of God that he has predestinated these things to be and they, they must be, they must be. Isaiah said, Isaiah 46, 11, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executes my counsel from a far country. Yes, I have spoken it and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. There's no wondering with God whether he can accomplish his purposes or not. There's no dependence on man to accomplish the purposes of God. He uses men in the accomplishment of his purposes, but he doesn't need man to accomplish his purposes. There are many things he did without man altogether. Isaiah 48, three, I have declared the former things from the beginning and they went forth out of my mouth and I showed them, I did them suddenly and they came to pass. So he says, I showed you what I was going to do, and then I did it. Not like these guys that give these ambiguous statements and then try to figure out a way to say that it happened over here somewhere. He gave specific things, and specific things happened. Isaiah 48 and verse 5, I have even from the beginning declared it to you. Before it came to pass, I showed it to you, lest you should say, my idol has done those, and my graven image, and my molten image has commanded them, lest you should have work it out some way in which God didn't do it. All right, Revelation 4 
in verse 1 and then verse 2, he says, and immediately upon this trumpet call, immediately I was in the spirit. It's a divine and it's an effectual call. It immediately takes place. What immediately takes place? He was in the spirit. That is, in the spirit because these are spiritual things and these are spiritual things that cannot be known unless he was in the spirit, unless he was enraptured in the spirit, carried along by the spirit of God as holy men were in order to give us the revelations that God gave to them. These are not things that can be discovered naturally through a diligent observation of a curious mind. These are not things that can be discovered naturally through the diligent observation of the curious mind. There's much that we can observe and learn in God's world. And we, we dig it out. And George Washington Carver used to go around asking God to help him dig it out. And God helped him. And they were things that he could work out with God's grace. But these things are not things that can be worked out just by turning the wheels in our head. These are things that have to be revealed. Barnes wrote that he was at once absorbed in the contemplation of the visions that were before him. He was doubtless still at Patmos, and these things were made to pass before his mind as a reality. That is, they appeared as real to him as if he saw them, and they were in fact a real symbolical representation of things occurring in heaven. This is a revelation of unseen things above. If this revelation had not been given to John, we would not know these things. We would not be able to know these things. Even now, they are revealed. As they are revealed, they must be spiritually discerned because the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Even in the divine revelation, we have to ask for God's help to understand it aright, understand it spiritually and not just take it academically or, or as a natural man. So he says, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, another behold, the second behold, a throne was set in heaven. The first behold or the first wonder was an open door. The second wonder is now that he's through the open door, a throne set in heaven. Jeremiah 7.12, a glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary, a glorious high throne. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake you will be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. It's not that he was surprised that there would be a throne in heaven, but he's surprised, behold, at the grandeur of it, because we will all be surprised at the grandeur of it. We can Think of it, we can meditate upon it, we can have times in which it comes to us more powerfully than other times, but once faith becomes sight, it will be a wonder. Ezekiel wrote in Ezekiel 10, 1, I looked and behold in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And Ezekiel 10.4, and then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud and the court full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Daniel wrote in Daniel 7.9, I beheld till thrones were cast down, these upon the earth, and the Ancient of Days did sit on that eternal throne, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was like a fiery flame and as wheels as burning fire and a fiery stream issued and came from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered to him, 10,000s, time 10,000s stood before him and the judgment was set and the books were open. So every time we get a view, we begin to get a view of the throne, we begin to get a view of, of fire, of, of, of a glorious appearance, of a brightness, and beautiful colors. Heaven is a place of rule, a place of order and security because God is on the throne. And because God's throne is something that's beautiful. It's something that's beautiful. 
man's throne can be beautiful as they follow the Lord. And we have instances in history where men who loved God sat upon the throne to the benefit of their people. Too many other times we have thrones and we looked at those thrones and it was a very ugly thing because men oppressed out of that throne. But whenever John or Ezekiel or Daniel sees the throne in heaven, it is, a, it is something gorgeous. It is something beautiful because of the one who sits upon the throne. So Barnes writes that Isaiah had his vision in the Holy of Holies of the temple. Ezekiel by the river Kibar, John looked directly into heaven and he saw the throne of God and the encircling worshipers. And one sat on the throne. It is remarkable that John gives no description of him who sat on the throne, nor does he indicate who he was by name. Neither does Isaiah or Ezekiel attempt to describe the appearance of the deity, nor are there any intimations of that appearance given from which a picture or an image could be formed. So much do their representations accord with what is demanded by correct taste and so seduciously have they guarded against encouragement of idolatry. So we know that God is a spirit and he does not have a body like men. We know that God sits and dwells in light, inapproachable is what the scripture says, that no man can see God and live. So what John is seeing is symbolic representations of God and his throne because no man can see God and live. It is not possible for the creature to fully gaze upon deity and continue to exist. So what God gives us are condescensions to us, representations to speak of the glory of his character and the glory of his rule. Clark wrote, there is here no description of the divine being so as to point out any similitude, shape, or dimension. The description rather aims to point out the surrounding glory and the effulgence rather than the person of the almighty king. In Exodus 24, that very unusual situation where Moses goes up with the elders Exodus 24, 9, then went up Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles, the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, and they saw God and did eat and drink. This representation of God which makes the sin of Nadab and Abihu all the more culpable, actually, because they had seen something of the glory of God to so easily disregard his word and his law, they were struck dead. But these representations that have been given throughout the scriptures, these appearances of God are often in a symbolic way, his throne and the one who sits upon the throne. So back to Revelation 4. He says in verse, verse, end of verse 2, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne and sight like an emerald. Doddridge writes that he who sat was in the form and luster of his appearance like the vivid, though soft and agreeable color of the emerald was especially prevalent, appeared around about the throne, expressive of that propitiousness and kindness and of the covenant relation to his people, which the blessed God is pleased to acknowledge in the midst of his transcendent glory. <coughs> Some see the greens that are mentioned here as that of life in the covenant of God with his people. Meyer says it is sufficient that here where the eternal and personal foundation of all that follows is portrayed, the holy glory and righteousness of God appears in most intimate union with his immutable and kind grace. 
so that thus the entire impending development of the kingdom of God and the world unto the last end, as it is determined by that wonderful, indivisible nature of the holy, just, and gracious God, as well in its course as its goal, must correspond to this threefold glory of the living God. Consequently, this fundamental vision contains everything that serves the terror of enemies, but the consolation of friends for the one who is enthroned. When we look at the one who is enthroned, it is John, and it's John speaking to the church, and it is when we think about in literature past, when they talked about the gods and the various way the gods were presented to people, um, often in such a fearful specter and sometimes in a mocking specter that the people needed to always cower and always be afraid and they needed to always recognize that the gods may do something to them at any moment. We have a very different vision and a very different idea that, that John gives to us of our covenant God that he has presented to us in the most beautiful colors, in the most glorious aspects of these things so that our hearts are not struck with some kind of slavish fear like most of the nations have with their gods, but our hearts are enraptured and drawn to the vision that is given to us of this God. Just like we're drawn to if we uh, most of us are not in the business of buying large quantities of emeralds or diamonds or anything else, but every now and then I like to go through a jewelry shop just for the fun of it and pretend that I actually could buy some of those things. And look at these giant emeralds and these giant gemstones because they are beautiful. They are beautiful. They're lovely. And so that the character of God is, is presented to us in this symbolic appearance of these beautiful gems and also just this aura around the throne, the rainbow with an aura of an emerald with it, presenting to us the most possible lovely view of the God that we will one day approach in eternal glory. We will approach with full reverence, but also with love and with expectation and with desire to be with him. And so many of the, the gods of the nations, it's not a God that you would want to dwell with, those gods. Our God is presented as somebody that we will be ravished by and, and be in love with and be welcomed into his presence, <laughs> which may be hard for us to comprehend in our own sinful state right now. But the fact of the matter is, is that the door is opened because of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ and we shall be received. The saints shall be received and will feel received by what they approach to. In the pulpit commentary, he writes, the rainbow is here as always in Genesis, a token of God's faithfulness to keep his promises. It is therefore a fit sign of comfort to these persecuted Christians to whom and for whom edification this message is sent. As we are reminded by the pulpit commentary that this is written to saints and in many of these churches that were in very difficult circumstances, this is a picture of comfort to them. This is what they will attain to as they overcome by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and loving out their lives until death, to be received into such, such glory, such love, such uh, acceptance by the one true and eternal God. Father, we thank you for your word. We, we ask for you to help us, O oh Lord, in the midst of a book full of symbols and a book uh, that has much to be meditated upon. We, we feel like there's much here, but often feel like, how can it be related? And yet, we are thankful what is related, Lord, and how you do condescend to our uh, humanity and our human state in order to give us the comforts of Christ and the comforts of our God through Christ. I pray that you would bless the text to our souls and continue to give us 
understanding in it. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.